Well, thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you to the Society for inviting me to come here and, and speak. I hope you can all hear me. If that ceases to be the case, please let me know and I'll, I'll try harder. And it's lovely to see so many of you here despite the viral pandemic that we're undergoing. This is a subject I've been talking about and thinking about for some years now. So thank you all very much for coming, particularly those who've heard me talk about this stuff before. The motivation for doing so again, um, as, as our president has just uh, stated, was there is a book <laughs> published uh, just last year. There is a discount available to those of you moved to purchase one as a result of, of this evening. Um, so having just been elected a fellow, I thought with the book this would be a good opportunity to come and talk about this stuff again. So what are we talking about? Now, around about 100 years ago, Micklethwaite published a fairly wide-ranging article on aspects of Anglo-Saxon <coughs> architecture. And almost as a passing comment, part of this article, he said, here's three towers which he found very weird, because when they were built, these towers had no name. These are church towers. Two had an uh, eastern chancel, a small structure, one retains its western baptistry, one has a western spiral staircase, but essentially when built, the main body of these churches was contained within a freestanding tower. He called these tower nave churches, which is a, a horribly clunky term, but we're stuck with it. And um, these churches survive in the landscape, quite a few survive, because in the later period, generally in the 12th century, they were given a nave, turned into the western towers of conventional congregational churches um, and their origin was, was lost and put off. But if we knew nothing else about these buildings, which is not my original idea, others have talked about the subject before, if we knew nothing else about them, then their tiny capacity for worshippers, combined with their extraordinarily elaborate form and ostentatious architecture, would mean we could believe there were buildings of the elite. Now, about uh, 25 years ago, David Parsons, uh, who is here, set out drawing up a list of further examples to add to the handful then already known. And since then, Warwick Rodwell has also increased our number of these sites. So what I set out to do was to find as many sites as I possibly could and fully explore this idea that they're buildings of the elite. So I got to about 40 examples uh, in all, of which about 15 are a bit earlier. They're generally found at monasteries built by kings and bishops and they're doing something slightly different, so I won't talk about them here. There's also a few known in Scotland. Again, something slightly different happening there, so I'll stick to the examples generally 10th and 11th century, built principally at the level of the parish church, what would become parish churches. So these are buildings of the locality, generally late 10th and 11th century in date. Now they're fairly general across England. This seems to follow our knowledge of the distribution of Anglo-Saxon architecture generally. They're absent from East Anglia. East Anglia's got these equally weird round towers that seems to be their sort of local tradition. Perhaps that was their, their local manifestation of, of lordship, because I won't go into that here. So, as I say, the sort of null hypothesis is that these are buildings of a social elite. Now, when I looked at them, almost all the examples were found at manorial sites. Um, or had some other fairly clear aristocratic context for their construction. Now, um, the evidence for some of these is very good, so some have archaeological evidence for a manor house adjacent. The evidence for others is rather flakier, perhaps they're next to a manor house, the date of that manor house is unknown, for example. But taken together, all but one, there's always one, all but one of these towers has a fairly good royal context for its construction. 
So this bears out the hypothesis that these, these are buildings of a elite. So these are essentially towers built by the local aristocracy of late Anglo-Saxon and early Norman England. Um, so fun as it would be to talk about all 24 examples over the course of this afternoon, I'll choose just two fairly representative examples which show the sort of material that we're dealing with, and then I'll set about placing them within some kind of wider context. So, fairly briefly, here is one. This is in Lincolnshire, it's at Caister, and it appears when it was built to have been completely freestanding. There's an extraordinarily thick wall between the nave and the tower. This appears to be because the two structures are but, they are not of the same date. Architecturally, the nave is probably late 11th, 12th century. The tower is at least mid 11th century. It's quite possibly earlier. The tower was built on a sort of a low hill. There's this awkward set of steps between the tower and the nave. The tower arch is off centre to the rest of the building. It's Norman, but the tower is not. Taken together, this seems to imply that there was no nave present here originally, and it was fairly awkwardly shunted on at a sort of slightly later date. Um, and as part of this study, many of these buildings survived, some are known from excavation. I did analysis of the fabric to try and fully understand them. As the name may suggest, Caister is in origin a Roman fortified settlement. You can see the enclosure preserved within the townscape, and the church sits within the middle of this enclosure. It was excavated in the 1960s by Philip Bratt, and he observed that the tower is built of this really awful local ironstone. In high winds, you can feel it sort of sprinkling down on your head, whereas the enclosure that the Romans had is a much nicer limestone. They didn't use the limestone to build the church, they did use the limestone to build quite a lot of the later, the later medieval and early post-medieval town of Caister. So it seems to be that when this tower <laughs> was built in its pomp, it sat within a moderately intact Roman fortified enclosure, which was later dismantled as times changed. There's evidence for an early medieval elaboration to the eastern gate of the town, and the town does not sit within the enclosure. The Population and mercantile focus of this town was outside the gate. So, this was a reserved enclosure, presumably of an elite, which was borne out by the position here of a castle uh, during the 12th century, which seems to have used the Roman enclosure as its bailey and presumably also, therefore, this tower or this church as its chapel. Uh, so, who may have built this tower? The Doomsday Book gives us a clue. Uh, Earl Walker had a church here, presumably this church, and he had a considerable estate, and he had here a hall. So we can imagine that this hall was contained within this enclosure. This was his enclosure, and this tower was the Earl's tower that we still have today. Although it is on the buildings at risk register. Not for much longer, perhaps. Um, and there's there's sculptural evidence for high status burial within this site. So that's one. Uh, here's another. This is a building that many of you may know at Potton in Wiltshire. This was excavated um, by um, uh, in the 1960s, and it's this very very strange building which has been previously interpreted as a baptistry because a font was found here and it stands fairly near an older minster, so monastic church. Um, Warwick Rodwell imagines that it perhaps originally looked more like the building in the bottom left. It was a centrally planned, perhaps toriform wooden building to which chapels and a western porch were later added. I quite like that interpretation, but you know, others are available. And again, the Doomsday Book here is quite helpful. It says this is a, a valuable estate of the Bishop of Salisbury, but within that much larger estate, there is a smaller estate of six hides, 
the hide being enough land it's thought to maintain a farming community called the Tepehu, of which Alfred, with a, an Anglo-Saxon, a survivor, someone who, who was deposed during the conquest, had three of them and he had a priest. So perhaps this was his chapel. And as part of the excavations in the 60s, the very tip of an aisled hall was found just next to this presumed wooden tower. And to the south of that complex was half of a building interpreted as a stable. It's got a method road surface running through the middle of it and it aligns with the approach road to this site. I think perhaps it may have been a gatehouse. And this sits outside of the what appears to be the boundary of the Minster <coughs> Church. So I think we have a sort of uh, a smaller aristocratic estate centre stuck next door to a much larger Episcopal estate centre. And this was the Lord's residence, perhaps Elfweird, perhaps his predecessor, who knows. So that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with. As I say, this evidence for some is better and the evidence for some is worse. But these are found at lordly estates at manor houses from the late Saxon period onwards. So what do these manor houses look like? Now, over the last few decades, we've had the opportunity to excavate quite a number of these sites. And broadly speaking, they comprise a hall, uh, the essential component, other aristocratic buildings, set within an enclosure. Those are the basic conveniences. To which we can add often a close association with a church or a chapel. This is the origin of the close church manor house relationship in the later medieval landscape. Um, a gatehouse, perhaps like the one at the bottom, a tower. Now, when I was first looking at this stuff, these towers were sort of known, but only one or two examples. I don't think it's quite yet been appreciated that these towers were as widespread as they may well have been. So I'll, I'll briefly rehearse the evidence for these towers, which are not themselves churches. But it, it brings forward the idea that these tower made churches combine the tower, the chapel, perhaps the gatehouse, into one single aristocratic structure. This was David Parsons' idea originally. So lordly timber towers. I'll just rattle through these examples quickly. This was excavated um, back in the early 2000s by Gabriel Thomas. Four enormous posts set within a cellar at the residence of a bishop. The bishop had a chapel uh, just, just nearby and his hall was closely aligned with his tower. This tower contained a structured deposition of material culture which was interpreted as being a symbolic representation of the estate as a whole. So this building was important not just because of its physical scale and its prominence, but because of the symbolism that it may have had. Uh, another one, this is a Northamptonshire example. When this residence was built, again within an enclosure, there was a hall and there was a fairly substantial tower set within a small stockade, which was later replaced by a building interpreted as a barn by the excavator, which had itself a tower. So who knows what form that building may have taken. Um, another example from a bishop's residence, this time in Hampshire, tower closely aligned with a hall set within an enclosure. These are all of, of timber. An unpublished example at Ketton in Rutland, a tower, a hall actually aligned as a church associated with this Lord's residence set within a bounded enclosure. Thwing. If nothing else comes of, of this evening, if someone could tell me more about three, I would be eternally grateful. This is a fascinating site dug in the early 80s, which has never been published. It's a prehistoric enclosure set high on a hill in Yorkshire at a 100 meeting place. And uh, of all the things that go on with this enclosure in the late Saxon period, a church is established. The enclosure gains a northern Appendage. That appendage contains what appears to be a memorial residence, and that residence has a cellared tower of some pretension, by all accounts. I've contacted the excavator, I've not yet managed to get a plan of that building, but 
anyone knows more by all years. The Bear Tapestry, late 11th century, perhaps made in England, depicts a tower. Now, this is the scene where Harold is returning from France and he's off to visit the king and he lands on the Channel Coast. The name of this place is not identified on the tapestry, but we know that Bosom in West Sussex was Harold's main residence and chief channel port in this area, so we can assume this was his tower at Bosom. Again, it's of some pretension, it's four stories in height. It's got an enormous opening on the ground floor. This was interpreted by the late Derek Wren as perhaps being a gatehouse tower. Uh, the men inside are looking out for Harold's arrival, so we can assume that he was known to this place. So it had a function as a watchtower, which is something I'll return to later. And it's, it's carved with elaborate beast heads and all sorts. So these buildings may have been quite nice. Again, a final example, this is another Anglo-Saxon lord who survived the conquest and had at his residence in Bury St Edmunds a truly enormous tower. Perhaps we shouldn't take this literally, but at least it bears out the fact that these towers were potentially quite large and impressive. Um, this is a written source from about the year 1000, which has been fairly well debated. And it says that to be taken seriously as a lord in this period, you needed a certain amount of land and you needed some buildings. You needed a chapel, you needed a bell house. It doesn't say bell tower, I wish it did, but you know, perhaps it was not dissimilar. It needed what's been interpreted as a, some sort of fortified enclosure with a gatehouse and various other things. Now, this is sort of this is quite an important source because it, it not only says that you have to have buildings to be taken seriously as a lord, but it sheds a bit of light on what's going on in this period generally because it's only in this 10th and 11th century period that you get power fragmenting down to this local level. These much older, larger estates, their power for the first time is being held by local lords who can, for the first time, hold land and pass their land to their kin and establish themselves and wield power at a local level. So in the later medieval period, the authority of your local lord may be based upon such things as lineage. This was not the case then because local lords are only newly becoming a thing. They're having to establish themselves. Um, and so their lords, because they convince other people that they're lords, not because of any uh, any lineage that they may have. If you have the right amount of land and you have the right buildings, then you're a lord. And so these buildings, these towers, these tower nave churches, these halls, these enclosures, they're not just projecting status in a kind of woolly way, in a vague way. They are quite literally, they are justifying the position of that lord to wield the power and authority that he does. They are key to his expression of, of lordship. Um, so these towers and these tower of churches, I think, are doing that. They are embodying lordship. They're buildings of status, they are embodying lordship at a more fundamental level than that. But what else may they be doing? So this is, again, a fairly hokey early 12th century Norman chronicler who is relating the passage of the Viking army between Cambridge and Thetford. And as the army goes along, a lord, one man, who we know from other sources to be Oswy, climbs the steps of his church tower, um, strengthened by that place. There's the church, later rebuilt. We don't know what form it may have been. It may have been one of these freestanding tower churches. Who knows? And it sits within what the topography has as some kind of enclosure, and that enclosure contains a, a, a manor house. This would be a wonderful site for us today. So, strengthened by that place and by that tower, this lord manages to fight off the entire Viking army. Again, perhaps not to be taken literally, but when I looked at the landscape context for what's going on at this place in 
Balcham, it, it seems to bear something of what Henry of Huntington is saying now. So the tower was there. What's in orange is an analysis of what a theoretical tower of 10 metres in height can see of the landscape. It's got a reasonable view over bits of the Ickneyfield Way and a Roman road between Beckford and Cambridge, but not great. But next to the tower is uh, place no evidence for a beacon site. Now these beacons are now fairly well established as being uh, a feature of the Lake Saxon landscape. These war beacons, and that beacon site has a really good view over this route between Cambridge and Beckford. Next to the war beacon was a muster point, uh, a hundred meeting place on one of two linear earthworks which bounded or guarded or demarcated this uh, important regional route. So maybe the lord at his tower, who would have been responsible for the local defence and military um, system for this, for this area, Oswy had a watchman at his beacon. When trouble came, the beacon was lit. The forces gathered at the meeting point on this earthwork. If things were looking dicey, they returned to the Lord's bounded, fortified residence with its strong tower as a refuge. So it, this seems to bear out the evidence of what this Norman chronicler was saying 100 years later. And some, not all, but a number of these towers that I was looking at did seem to function as watchtowers, potentially, or, or they may well have done. Here's quite a nice example, this is in Berkshire, and it sits within what was probably a Roman enclosure originally, adjacent to a Roman road, well, which contains a manor house of unknown date, in its present form is, is early post medieval. And this tower, with the orange again, it has a really excellent view over the landscape. It could have acted as a watchtower in its own right, local lords would have had a, a responsibility for, for defence and military matters. It contains this landscape, a considerable beacon chain running all the way from the south coast um, and then turns west into Wiltshire. And when this tower was in inverted commas restored back in the 19th century, the architect noted that it had a flat roof originally which is heavily sooted. And he said this tower looked to him like a beacon tower. And if you look at the placement of evidence for these beacons, this tower completes the chain of beacons running through the landscape. We don't know, but perhaps this was again a watchtower, or even a beacon tower. And what else may these towers have been doing? Um, this is probably an exception, but at Bowes and Edmonds, at the monastery there, one of the reeves, one of the earls who looked after the abbey's huge estates in this region, one of the, the earls had here a tower, which he built, this is another town name, this is uh, of St Benedict, and this tower doubled as his son's residence. So we have a tower nave church built by a secular lord acting as a residential tower. Um, this lord, because he was the lord of the abbey, had his residence apparently at the abbey, not, not within a, a, a manor house in the town. So, and this is also another point that's probably worth making as to what these town nave churches are. Um, in this early medieval period, throughout the entire Anglo-Saxon period, there was precious little evidence, almost no evidence, for building in stone for secular buildings. Almost the only evidence we have of the reused Roman structures is churches. There seems to have been a, a cultural decision made that the only acceptable use for stone was building churches. And yet we'd expect of all the hundreds of settlement sites we've ever been dug, stone to be overrepresented in the archaeological record because it survived so well. This is not the case. Um, now, the reason for this, uh, for this separation, you can make your own minds up perhaps, but my interpretation of this was, um, was something to do with the meanings that these two materials may have had. 
because clearly the Anglo Saxons had a rich building tradition of stone, and clearly even the king who could have afforded to build this hall of whatever he liked chose to do it out of timber. So I think in this period, timber was a material of, of life, of transience. The lifespan of an earth class building is probably about the same as its occupant, whereas stone is not a material of transience, it's a material of permanence and eternity. And I think perhaps the Anglo Saxons believed to build something, to build a structure of eternity on earth would have been deeply impertinent because the only appropriate place for a building of eternity was in heaven or in God's house on earth. And yet, in this period, as I've said, local lords are just establishing themselves. And one of the best ways of getting authority is to imply permanence. This is Richard Bradley's idea of the creation of continuity. And you want to state your permanence, that you've always been there, and that you'll always be there, and, and your, your kin will be there after you. And what better way to do it by using stone, this highly expressive building material? in your lordly tower. We know there's a pre-existing tradition of timber lordly towers at residences in this period. If you stuck a chapel in one, you could make it out of stone. And I think that may be what's going on here with these family churches. And the architecture of a number of these churches, this is very distinctive Anglo-Saxon stuff. This is pilaster strip work, which is agreed to be a skew-morph of timber-framed building techniques, sort of transformed into a stone building. So I think perhaps the origin of a number of these tower and churches as lordly timber towers, as this existing tradition of building timber towers in the residence, this is bearing the origins of these buildings out. So what's going on here? Um, now, back in the 1970s, David Wilson said, wouldn't it be fun if these tower and churches he only knew of a handful when he was writing this. Wouldn't it be fun if these were the origin of Northern Castle keeps? So these, these townades manifest military status. They have a potential role in warfare. Um, potentially, they were residential. So when we think of Norman keeps, the ones that spring to mind are these, these palatial keeps, which were essentially very elaborate halls turned into towers. This is um, research done by Philip uh, Dixon. But these were the exception. These were built by kings. These is the very high end of society. The ones built by local lords were probably a lot more modest. They seem to have comprised small, tall, square, timber or stone towers like this, often found at gate houses. Um, so this is more what you'd expect to find. And these towers, these Norman castles, they seem to have more or less comprised, perhaps in the majority of instances, ringworks of earth and timber with a hall, uh, with a tower, perhaps acting as a gatehouse. And these, where studies have been made, occur at lordly residences from the late Saxon period. So there's enormous continuity between late Saxon lordly residences and early Norman castles, as you might expect, because the Norman conquest was the sort of musical chairs at the top of society. It's been argued not to have been such a, a massive cultural and societal change at all. Um, and again, the observation on the left has been made before, but these towers combine aspects of, of Anglo-Saxon architectural detail. So this one in Exeter has triangular windows, and long and short cornerstones. It's found at an existing Anglo-Saxon Lord's residence, the sort of the, the, the person who's been around Exeter. An example on the right was pointed out to me by um, uh, Philip Davis, I think it was. And he pointed out that this, which would have been a tower when built, I think it's been shortened, has pilaster strip work in the manner of these uh, lordly towers from the Saxon period. So we have spatial continuity and potential architectural continuity between <coughs> the castles and the towers built at the more normal, everyday Norman castles between the Norman and the Anglo Saxon period. Um, 
And again, the Bear Tapestry, this is the construction of the Mott at Hastings Castle. But there's a tower already there, and we think we know from what remains above ground and from documented evidence that this was a tower made church dedicated to St Mary, which already existed and which stood or marked or guarded the gate to that place. And there's a few other incidents of Norman castles incorporating tower nave churches or indeed building tower nave churches of their own. Oxford is now called an example, which is, which is um, truly enormous. Uh, Earls Barton has been figured as to be an undocumented modern daily castle at Earls Barton. Hastings, as I say, the evidence is there. Caister, I spoke about earlier, Portchester, a uh, a tower nave was there within a Lord's residence inside this Roman enclosure in the 11th century. The castle was established, that tower nave was kept as the castle chapel for some decades afterwards. There's other examples. I excluded from this study towers I couldn't satisfactorily demonstrate were freestanding when built, but there are ones which nearly made on the list at Newcastle on Tyne within the castle there, at Hereford Castle, and Burwell in Kentshire. And here's a slightly strange one. This is um, Richmond Castle, where the castle chapel here was built at the base of a tower, a tower which guards the entrance to the castle enclosure. This seems to be a slightly later Norman version of this existing tradition of, of lordly tower and churches at castles and lordly residences stretching back potentially for centuries. Um, so what do we make of this? Just to set this stuff in some kind of context, it seems to be that across Europe, Western Europe as a whole, not just England during this 10th and 11th century period, power was being fragmented down to a much more local level and was being exercised by a new class of local lords that sort of rise to the gentry. This is not just an English thing, this is a pan-Western European thing. And these lords also built Residences and at their residences, they built again modest, squarish towers to manifest their status. Um, so I'll just rattle through some fairly random examples. There are many uh, I could have chosen. So this is the original home of the Habsburg dynasty in Switzerland, a much more modest affair when it was built. Um, in Germany, you get these so called Bergfried, which seem to be perhaps late 9th century in origin. These, again, very tall, squarish towers built at the residences of, of lords. Um, the Iberian Peninsula has a profusion of them, of which many are known for place name evidence, often crowning hilltops and acting as, as watchtowers. Italy, at northern Italian towns in particular, um, you get the, uh, the local aristocracy competitively tower building. Uh, these towers of status. These didn't seem to have been uh, church towers, although they were often used as belfries. And in an article, uh, Derek Wren said that if you look at pre-fire panoramas of London, um, you can start to see towers which look potentially Anglo-Saxon too, because they have this distinctive pilaster strip work on them. I should say that a number of my sites Occurring towns, a place like Oxford had more than one town and church. So perhaps in a situation, perhaps not like that, but in late Saxon towns, lords who had their residences in these towns were competitively tower building against each other to, to manifest their wealth and status and authority, potentially. France, obviously, the immediate inspiration, as is thought to be the case for. Uh, Norman Castle. How much time do I have, by the way? You're all right. I'm all right. Okay. So again, um, a modest, in this example, timber tower built at a sort of proto-castle in 10th century France. And I could go on. But I think essentially what you have is all across Western Europe during the 10th and 11th centuries, you have local lords building towers at their residences, this new class of local aristocracy, 
to manifest status and project authority, as well as potentially these towers having a, a use in war. And I think in England, in the 10th and 11th centuries, you have lords building towers at their residences to project and manifest status, as well as potentially having a use in war. So I think we can now start to, to break down this division between Western Europe as a whole having what we think of as castles before 1066, and then only in 1066 does England become part of this wider tradition. Because I think we have this, uh, in John Goodall's phrase, a shared culture of aristocratic tower building across Western Europe during this period. And I think we can include England within this. It's just in England, for peculiar reasons, the towers they built, their residences, were all of timber unless they happened to contain a church, and then it was acceptable for them to be built out of stone. Um, so this is the existing model, simplistically presented. Now I think we can add to it. I think there's now something else going on. And uh, I leave you with uh, the words of the late uh, 11th century Archbishop of Canterbury. Many thanks indeed for listening. And I should say, if anyone has any further examples of either of these potentially freestanding towers that exist in the landscape or excavated examples, then I'd be delighted to hear about them. Thank you very much.